Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining the Garrison Institute's live interactive webinar. Our guest today is Rupert Spira. Rupert Spira is a renowned British spiritual teacher and has spent 40 years studying non-dual traditions, including the teachings of Krishnamurti, Rumi, Ramana Maharshi, Robert Adams, Jean Klein, and his main teacher, Francis Lucille. He is the author of The Transparency of Things, Presence, The Ashes of Love, and The Light of Pure Knowing. Before we begin today's session, I'll go over a few logistical items about our gathering. We're on a Zoom webinar, so participant audio and video are turned off. Uh, you only see Robert and for the time being myself uh, until we start the Q&A. For anyone unable to attend live, we are recording these sessions. You will have a chance to view the recordings as well as the schedule of up upcoming programs at the garrisoninstitute.org. We offer these sessions free of charge as a goodwill gesture to support our community during such times of heightened uncertainty. We would welcome donations of any amount to help us continue to offer these sessions. Thank you. Finally, we'll have time for Q&A during this gathering. Um, you could put your questions in the Q&A box uh, the lower part of your screen or by raising your hand by clicking on the participants button. Again, that's along the bottom of your screen by hovering your arrow over the participants button. The list of participants will appear on the right hand side and you should be able to see the raise hand button and you can click on that and we'll call on folks in order and then I will unmute you. Um, please note that you will be promoted um, to be visible to the audience. So be prepared if you ask a question um, that you will, your video will be shown. Thank you. In the interest of time, keep your questions brief, brief please. Um, we're on for an hour and a half and we'll respond to as many questions as we can. Please forgive us if we're not able to get to your question. Thank you again, Rupert, for being with us today and I'll turn it over to you. Well, your colleagues at Garrison, it's uh, lovely to join you in this um, virtual way from my sitting room in Oxford and um, welcome everyone from around the world. Um, I know that uh, Garrison uh, host a very eclectic uh, mix of uh, spiritual teachers and speakers uh, and uh, likewise uh, the attendees that come to Garrison re regularly uh, come from almost every religious and spiritual tradition. So I wanted to say uh, something briefly about the, the common element in all the great religious and spiritual traditions. If we were to distill the essence of all the great traditions into a single understanding it would uh, be something like this. Happiness is your nature. Or you are happiness itself. So we might wonder if happiness is our our nature, the very nature of our being or our self, then why do we not experience it all the time? And the answer is very simple. Whilst everybody knows their self to an extent, not everybody knows their self clearly as they essentially are. And it is this lack of clear self-knowledge 
that is responsible for the veiling or obscuring of the peace and happiness that is the very nature of our self. And it is for this reason that so much emphasis is placed on self-knowledge in all the great religious and spiritual teachings. What is meant by self-knowledge? Very simply, knowledge of our self, knowledge of our being, knowledge of what each of us refers to when we say simply I or I am. In fact, we think and speak the word I more often than any other word. And yet very few of us know clearly what the word I refers to. Everybody has a, a sense of I or a sense of myself. But in most cases, our sense of ourself is so thoroughly mixed up with the content of our experience, that we do not know ourself clearly. If you imagine that every conceivable drink is made mostly of water, but very few drinks taste of water. Why? Because the water is mixed up with other ingredients, tea, coffee, orange, apple, etc. So any drink that we are drinking, we are actually drinking water, tasting water but the taste of water is mixed with other ingredients. So we do not taste the water clearly. Well, our knowledge of ourself is a little bit like that. Our self is the clear water. That is the essential ingredient in all experience, whatever we are experiencing. It is we who are experiencing it. So we, our self, our being, is present in every experience, however wonderful or awful or neutral that experience may be. It is we who are experiencing it. But this we or this I is not clearly known because like the water mixed up with various ingredients, our self or our being is mixed up with the content of experience. And for this reason, whilst everybody knows their self to a certain extent, we don't know ourselves clearly. So the first step we take here is to extricate ourselves or separate ourselves out from the content of experience. This does not imply any rejection of experience, nor does it reply any, imply any manipulation of experience, let alone the getting rid of any experience. All that is necessary is to see clearly what element of experience is essential to us. And 
the, the essence of anything is the aspect of that thing that cannot be removed from it. So the essence of our self, our nature or our being is that element of our experience that remains behind when everything that is not essential to us has been removed. So start with your thoughts. No thought is essential to us. Even in the 10 minutes or so since this gathering started, most of us have had numerous thoughts. They arise, they exist briefly, and they vanish. We are the one that is aware of the thought. We are present before the existence of the thought during its existence and after it has vanished. The thought is not essential to us. Likewise, our feelings, even our most intimate and treasured feelings, are not essential to us. We give them up freely effortlessly every time we fall asleep at night. Our feelings visit us, they arise, they exist for a little longer than our thoughts usually, and then they vanish. Anything that vanishes from us or anything that is removed from us cannot be essential to us. Likewise, our bodily sensations, the tingling sensation behind our eyes or our chest or hands or feet, the temperature of the air on our skin, the feeling of hunger, a headache. None of these sensations are essential to us. They are all appearing, existing, and vanishing. Therefore, they cannot be what we essentially are. Please follow me in your experience. Don't follow me philosophically or intellectually. Check out, test everything that I am saying in your experience. Likewise, no perception is essential to us. By perception, I mean sights, sounds, tastes, textures, and smells. All of these appear exist and disappear. No activity or relationship is essential to us. So ask yourself the question, when everything that can be removed from me is removed from me. What remains? What is it that accounts for the undeniable continuity of experience? No thought, feeling, sensation, or perception is continuous. If thoughts, feelings, sensations, perceptions, activities, and relationships were all there was to experience, 
then experience would be a series of unconnected fragments. But experience is not like that. Experience is one smooth, continuous whole. From what does our experience derive its continuity? There must be one element of experience that remains consistently present throughout all changing thoughts, images, feelings, sensations, etc. Whatever that is, is what we call I. When we were five years old, we referred to ourselves as I. When we were 10 years old, we referred to ourselves as I. When we were 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, etc. years old, we referred to ourselves as I. And we always feel that we are the same I. Do not each of you feel that you are essentially the same person now as you were this morning or yesterday? or last year, or 10 years ago, or when you were five-year-old children. Well, what is it in your experience of yourself that has remained the same? No thought, image, feeling, sensation, perception, activity or relationship has remained the same. So none of these qualify as I. I know that many of you will have explored your self in this way many times before, and some of you will be considering these matters for the first time, but I recommend that we all explore ourself in this way as if for the first time. For every time we make this investigation into ourself, into the nature of our being. We erode the old habit of believing and feeling that we are a cluster of thoughts, images, feelings, memories, sensations, perceptions, activities, and relationships. These are things that we are aware of. They are not what we are. when everything that can be removed from us is removed from us. What remains is just the simple fact of being aware or awareness itself. Everything that we are aware of appears, exists for a while and vanishes. The fact of being aware or awareness itself alone remains consistently present throughout all changing experience. Everything that we are aware of changes, but the fact of being aware is the one changeless element of all experience. Awareness 
or the fact of being aware is not something that we become as a result of this investigation. It is not something that requires effort or practice or discipline. It is what, it is what each of us already and always essentially is. But most of us overlook ourself because we have allowed ourself to become so thoroughly entangled in the content of our experience that whilst everybody has a sense of being their self, not everybody knows their self clearly. So the first step is the recognition, I am awareness. The second step is the recognition of the nature of the awareness that I am. Whilst it is a great discovery to recognize I am awareness, that recognition is not yet sufficient to bring us peace and happiness. It is necessary to recognize the, the nature of the awareness that I am. And to do so, notice that you, awareness, we, awareness, are not just the, the knower or the witness of experience. We are the medium or the space within which all experience arises. So understand and more importantly, feel that you are the aware openness, the aware emptiness in which the entire content of experience arises. Just as it is on account of the emptiness of physical space that there is room for physical objects within it. So likewise, it is on account of the emptiness, the transparency, the silence of ourself, that there is room for experience within us. To understand and more importantly feel that you are this aware, openness, this aware emptiness, which is both the knowing element in all experience and also the medium or the space within which all experience arises. and see that just as nothing that takes place in physical space agitates that space in any way, so nothing that takes place in our self-awareness disturbs awareness in any way. All thoughts, images, memories, feelings, sensations, perceptions arise in the space of awareness and are known by the presence of awareness. The content 
of our experience makes no difference to awareness. Awareness is always in the same changeless, changeless condition, open, luminous, empty, loving. Notice that we, awareness, do not negotiate experience. We don't say yes to some experiences and no to others. Our thoughts and feelings say yes to some experiences and no to others. In other words, our thoughts and feelings are open to some experiences and closed to other to others seek some experiences and resist others but we the presence of awareness are always simply in the now eternally present now changeless wide open open indiscriminately to the current experience. Awareness resists nothing, nor does it hold on to anything. And thus the nature of awareness is peace. Not a peace that is the outcome of experience. Not a peace that depends upon what does and does not take place in experience. But a peace that is prior to and independent of the content of experience and lies, so to speak, in the background of all experience, however agitated or disturbed our thoughts and feelings may be. The, the inherently peaceful presence of awareness lies, so to speak, in their background, just as we might say at least to begin with that the colorless screen lies behind the images in a movie and in fact just as the colorless screen does not simply lie behind the colorful images in the movie but utterly pervades them so it is true to say that our being, the simple fact of being aware or awareness itself, lies not only in the background of experience, but pervades all our experience. Like space pervades every object. And for this reason, it is not necessary to deny, repress, manipulate or get rid of any aspect of experience. If we go deeply into the heart of any experience, we find ourself there, the inherently peaceful presence of awareness. Likewise, the awareness with which each of us is currently aware of our experience is in exactly the same condition 
as the awareness with which each of us was aware of our experience 10 minutes ago or 10 days ago or 10 years ago or when we were 10 year old children. Awareness is always in the same condition. Just like the space, the physical space of the room in which you are now sitting. If you had taken a sample of the space in your room 10 minutes ago, 10 days ago, 10 years ago, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, and compared all the samples, the space would always be the same. Likewise, if we take a sample of ourself, if we taste or know ourself, the simple fact of being aware or awareness itself at any moment of experience, whatever the content of the experience, the taste of ourself is always the same. Peace. Fulfillment. Happiness. In other words, nothing ever happens to ourself. No experience hurts it, stains it, destroys it, modifies it, adds anything to it, or removes anything from it. That is why our self, the fact of being aware or awareness itself, never negotiates experience. It is why we awareness are always wide open to all experience. It is why we awareness say yes, indiscriminately, impartially, to all experience. Because we awareness know that our peace and our sense of wholeness or fulfillment is not dependent upon what does or does not happen in experience. So I would like to suggest an experiment for everyone, or at least anyone who would be interested over the coming days and weeks. Instead of facing your experience as a conditioned bundle of thoughts and feelings, reacting and responding to every experience according to that conditioning, Face every experience as the presence of awareness. Be knowingly the presence of awareness. And face every experience from its point of view. In other words, without the slightest resistance to it. All suffering is resistance. And because awareness does not know the meaning of the word resistance, awareness knows no suffering. Its nature is lasting peace and happiness. And it is for this reason that it is said, the direct path to peace and happiness is simply to know oneself as one essentially is.
So let's let's begin our conversation. Please feel free to ask about anything you like. Okay, Rupert, I'm going to now um, find Anne Fleming, who has a question. I'll promote her in a moment. Anne, I'm going to promote promote you to panelists now. Your video will be shown to ask your question. I can see your name, Anne, but your microphone is still muted. That's why we can't hear you. There we are. No, it's still muted. That's it. And if you could kindly start your video as well. Thank you. There you are. We're getting there. We can see you now. We can't hear you yet. Down in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, and you'll see a little microphone icon that says mute. Just unmute your mic. Oh, it is unmuted. We should be able to hear you. Uh, and you are unmuted, but we can't seem to hear you. I'll read your question if that's okay. Uh, Anne asked, can you say something about using this self-knowledge while taking action in the world? Yes. The, the, our action in the world is informed, and by our thoughts and feelings. So the important question is, on whose behalf do our thoughts and feelings arise? Are our thoughts and feelings simply an extension of our past conditioning? Or are our thoughts and feelings and their subsequent expression in our activities and relationships informed by our knowledge of ourself as awareness? So, that is why I suggested that we face our experience as the presence of awareness. What I didn't go on to say, so I'm glad you've asked this question, is that we then engage with the experience. We engage with activities and relationships uh, from this perspective of ourself as awareness. And we allow that knowledge that feeling understanding to inform our activities and relationships in the world. Thank you, Anne. I'm sorry I can't hear you, but uh, nice at least to see you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question here from Anna Figueroa. Anna, I'm going to, uh, a moment please. For some reason I can't find her, but Anna's question was, what happens to awareness during, for example, moments like dreamless sleep or full sedation before surgery. Was it was it Anne again? Anna. Anna. Um, Anna. Very simply, nothing ever happens to awareness. Let me give you an example of what happens in deep sleep. The content of experience is removed. I'm presuming that you're looking at my image on your screen. So in deep sleep, our thoughts, images, feelings, memories, sensations, perceptions, activities, and relationships, they all leave us. That is, they leave us awareness. 
but awareness remains as it always is just as when i cover my camera the image vanishes but your screen remains the same nothing happens to the screen so it's the same it's the same under anesthetic it's the same when the body dies when the body dies remember um i likened um, awareness to the space the physical space of the room in which each of us is now sitting uh, that room the space of the room in which each of us is sitting seems to be limited by the four walls of the room but if we were each of us to take a sample of the space in the room in which we are currently sitting and someone were to take a sample of the same space in let's say a hundred years time when the building that we are living in has been taken down and then compare the two samples that they will be identical in other words the space in the room in which each of us is now sitting is not now limited by the four walls of the room when the room is taken down when the building is demolished nothing will happen to the space well our self is like that our self now seems to be contained within the four walls of our body so to speak it seems to be confined within and limited to and even generated by our body it's true that the fact of being aware or the sense of myself does pervade our body just as space pervades a room but just because the sense of being myself or the fact of being aware fills our body does not mean that it is limited to our body or generated by our body just as the fact that space fills your room now does not mean that it is limited to the four walls of your room so awareness is always always in the same pristine indestructible luminous open resistanceless condition thank you rupert we have a question from mary morgan mary i'm going to promote you hi rupert can you hear me I can hear you, Mary, but I can't see you. Can you turn your, your video on? All right. Bottom left-hand corner. There you are. Rupert, I've been thinking about that space that you're talking about. Um, this building is due to be destroyed and taken very soon. And... I realize now that the, the space will always be the same. And I, I have this feeling that I will be too. You know, I will be the same regardless of whether it's here or not. I'm not making myself very clear. Yes, you're making yourself clear. I understand. Okay, so in these, it's very, you know, this is a very unknowing, uncertain time for all of us. And it feels like to me that then that, that our, that the space or this awareness stays regardless of what is happening out there, regardless of what's Mary, everything objective is uncertain. In fact, it is no more uncertain now than it was last year or five years ago. Yeah. It's just that our customary certainties, our so-called certainties, are now realized to be very uncertain. In fact, they're always uncertain. But so objective experience is always uncertain. But there is one thing, Mary, 
that is not uncertain. And that is your being. Yes. It has remained unwaveringly present at every moment of your life. It has never flickered. It is the constant friend that is with you always. And as you feel your death approaching, the, mm -hmm. the, the one thing that is important for you to do is to give your attention to your being and to let everything else slowly fall away. That is the best preparation, not only for life, to give one's attention to, to one's being and let whatever comes come and let whatever goes, goes. But it is also the best preparation for death. Yes. And, and if we do this, people that do this, I'm sure you, you know of them, and, and I'm sure you have experience of this yourself, that as the objective elements of our experience fall away, the, our being begins to emerge from the background. It begins to shine mm. more brightly. Mm. Contents of experience, it's like an image fading on a screen. As the image fades, the screen seems to become more and more visible. In fact, it was always visible, but it was apparently obscured by the image. So as the objective content of our experience falls away, our being becomes magnified. It, it takes the place in the foreground of our experience. And that is why people who are in touch with their being become more radiant and more peaceful and more joyful as they die because that their, their being is emerging from the background of experience. And I have to say, Mary, I, I, I see that quality in, in you. So I, I know that you know what I'm speaking of. Yeah. Yes. Sweet to see you again, Mary. Take care. Thank you, dear. Bye. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Steve, Steve has his hand up. I'm going to promote you, Steve Cole. Taking a moment, I see his name. <laughs> but your video, neither your video nor your mic are turned on, Steve. Steve, could you please unmute yourself? There you go. Okay. There we are. Good. Hi, Steve. Hi, Rupert. I don't know if you remember me. Uh, I remember your face, yes. yes. I don't remember where from or when from, but I remember your face, yeah. Temecula, about 15 years ago. Was it really? Yes. Wow. Well, um, good to see you again. Before I took a path that was a total detour. Um, okay. Oh, um... I'm not even sure how to put this. Um, there's an ongoing frustration because I've been having glimpses, like an, an awareness that no thought, no sensation, no perception tells me anything about me. Yet I still feel just tightly entwined with this body-mind experience. And I'm not sure how to do the things you're saying, how to live from this, for lack of a better word, background with my experience. So I was hoping to get some feedback or something on that. So is it clear to you, Steve, that you are essentially the presence of awareness with which you are aware of your experience. I mean, are, are you now not the one that is aware of your, this conversation? Yes, I am. I am the one aware. And you are not only aware of the, the sight of my face, 
but the, and the sound of my voice. Uh, but you don't you don't mistake yourself for the sight of my face or the sound of my voice. You don't think I am Rupert. No, I, no. Okay. Why not? Because because you're aware of them. You you you're not Rupert. You're aware of Rupert. Yes. You're aware of your own thoughts and feelings in exactly the same way that you are aware of the image of my face and the sound of my voice. They may seem to be a little closer to you. Actually, they're not even closer to you. No experience is at a distance from the awareness that knows it. But I grant that your thoughts and feelings may seem to be closer to you than the sight of my face or the sound of my voice. But nevertheless, you are still aware of them in just the same way that you are aware of the sight of my face and the sound of my voice. Is, is that not so? With a little bit of a twist, it seems that I am aware of an experience, like a physical experience when it's happening. Okay. I, I, I seem to be aware of a thought after it's happening. Well, it doesn't matter what the order is. You're aware of my face. You're aware of the sensation. You're aware of a thought. You're aware of a feeling. You're aware of the sound of my voice. Then you're aware of another thought. Then you're aware of a sensation in the body. It doesn't matter what order experience okay. comes in. Whatever order it comes in, you are aware of it. Yes. Now, why do you mistake yourself for a thought or a feeling, but you don't mistake yourself for the sight of my face or the sound of my voice? Why do you say one of them is me and one of them is one, you say one of them is something I am and the other is something I am aware of? O on what basis do you make this distinction? No, no evidence just seems to happen. Well, I just feel it feels like just glued to me. It's not glued to you, Steve. Every time you fall asleep at night, your thoughts, your feelings, sensations, perceptions, effortlessly leave you if they were glued to you they would yeah. remain with you in deep sleep you would continue to be aware of mm -hmm. your thoughts feelings, sensations and perceptions in deep sleep you'd never be able to get away from them oh god glued to you. But, <laughs> but how long does a thought last when a thought is finished it vanishes okay it glued to you if every thought you had ever had was glued to you you'd have millions of thoughts in your mind simultaneously but you don't even now since we've been talking Numerous thoughts have appeared, existed, and vanished. Okay. But nothing is glued to you, Steve. That's the beauty of it. You're like empty space. Nothing sticks. Nothing is glued to you. You awareness, you accept everything impartially and indiscriminately, and you never cling on to something and say, I don't want you to leave. You just, you're just like empty space. You let it come and you let it go. Okay. Just see that and live like that. When I remember, just live like that. Live like that. Now, first of all, first of all, recognize I am the presence of awareness, which allows everything, welcomes everything in, and then lets everything go. No, don't make an effort to let things go. Don't turn this into a practice. It's not necessary to practice letting go. It is the nature of awareness to let everything come and let everything go. Don't turn it into a practice. You don't need, you only need to practice something that is not already the case. You awareness are already the open empty space in which, which, which allows all experience, which says yes indiscriminately to all experience. And then when every experience goes, it says, fine, nice to have known you. Mm -hmm. So just recognize the nature of yourself, awareness, and then make this your new default identity. Live as that in the face of all experience. I guess I've got the first part where I know I'm awareness, but I'm not sure what that awareness is. And sometimes it gets forgotten. Oh, it's natural, Steve, to forget because we have all been... Um, encouraged by our culture to focus our, con our, our attention on the content of our experience. How, how many people on this, at this gathering were asked when they were 
children or teenagers or students, by their parents, teachers or professors, what is it that is aware of your experience? Hardly anyone. Mm. Or think of all the, the thousands of hours collectively that we all spent in our education, giving our attention to one thing alone, knowledge, experience, facts, thoughts, feelings, activities, relationships. Not once did any of our teachers or professors say, but what is it that knows mm -hmm. all of these? What is it that knows or is aware of all of this? So mm -hmm. is it any wonder that we all forget or overlook the presence of awareness, Steve? We've just been educated to. But now I'm, I'm trying to remind you of, the, of, of yourself, the simple fact of being aware. So make it a habit to remember yourself, to go back to yourself again and again and again until experience begins to lose its capacity to take you away from yourself. And, and, and then you'll begin to find yourself stable in this recognition of yourself as awareness. And you'll feel, you begin to find that you, you face your experience from the perspective of awareness rather than from a, a, a bundle of conditioned thoughts and feelings. Yeah, so it's, a, it's just remembering this whenever I can. Yes, to begin with, we, we feel that we go back to ourself and then we get pulled out again by experience. Then we go back to ourself. We get pulled out again by experience. We go back to ourself. But every time we go back to ourself, the capacity of experience to pull us away from ourself gets gradually weakened. And we begin to find that we not only visit ourselves momentarily, we not only have a glimpse of our true nature briefly, but we begin to stay there, to rest there. And in time, we notice that we, we've moved in, so to speak. It is, it is where we live. We still face our experience. We still engage with experience, relate with people. But we do so from this perspective. And the beautiful thing about this perspective is that we discover that the peace and the happiness for which we previously sought in objects, substances, activities, circumstances, relationships, etc., we, we begin to find that in ourselves. So we no longer seek peace, happiness, fulfillment, love in the world. It doesn't mean to say that we don't engage in activities and relationships. We do, but we no longer do so for the purpose of finding peace and happiness. Yeah. Our engagement in the world comes from the experience of peace, joy, and love. It is not trying to extract peace, joy, and love from the world and from people. And it is impossible for situations, objects, substances, people to, to give us peace and happiness. There's no, nothing that ruins a relationship more quickly than our expectation or even our demand that our companion behave in such a way that conforms to our idea of what we need to be happy. It's a recipe for disaster in relationships. Just That's just one example. Yeah. It's been an old habit of trying to look at my life as a problem to be solved. Yeah, with all the training and conditioning I've had over the years. Oh, but, but, and you and you just you just see, you and Francis keep saying stop that. <laughs> yeah. Or leave it alone. Let it do what it wants. That's not you. There are no, there are no problems. I know. <laughs> there are just situations. Our problem there's only one problem, Steve. It's very simple. It is our resistance to what is. Mm -hmm. but, but it's too late to resist what is. What is is already what Here. is. Yes. Resisted. Yes. But all we do by resisting it is making ourselves miserable. That's it. That's yeah. all the only result of it. Why not just turn around and say yes? 
to your current experience. There may be a situation, there may be something that requires a response from you, but now that your, your thoughts and feelings are no longer um, informed by this a neurotic, anxious, needy, unfulfilled self, you will find that the, your response to your current circumstances will be so much more effective and efficient. Uh, you, you, your activities and relationships will bring peace and joy and harmony and love into the situation in which you find yourself engaging. Great to see you again, Steve. Where do you live? Are you live in, in, in the Southern California now? Yes, I live in San Diego. I've been here the whole time. Oh, with Mia Francesco. Lovely. Yes, and I still go back up to Temecula whenever it's open. Um, it's all closed down now. But <laughs> yes, it is. Well, I hope our paths may cross there again. I day. hope so, too. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Hey, care, Steve. Lovely to see you again. Thank you again. Thank you, Steve. We have a question from Lisa Elovic. I will promote you. Lisa, hi. Hi. I, there you are. Hi, Lisa. Hi, how are you? Um, hello from South Florida, from Delray Beach. Um, thank you so much for all you do. Um, your teachings have been transformative for me and, and my family, for my children. So thank you. Um, my question is, um, is it possible to be in a healthy, intimate relationship with someone that may be on a different spiritual path than you? Um, and, and more specifically, uh, if you are in a relationship with someone that is very based in intellect and logic and may not be open to more esoteric teachings? The answer is yes, Lisa. The answer is yes. <laughs> what, 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 what causes problems in relationship is not the way the other person is being, whether they are intellectual or whether they're uh, into Christianity, but we're into Buddhism, or whether they're into Buddhism and we're into Sufism. None of that is the problem in the relationship. What is a problem in a relationship is our demand that the other person behaves in the way that we want them to behave so that we can be happy. That's the problem in relationships. If you relieve your uh, companion or your husband from the demand to be in a particular way so that you can be happy, in other words, leave him free. And in order to do that, you can't impose that on yourself. You can only do that, and it, it, it's actually, it happens spontaneously. If you know that you are free, you, awareness, need nothing from your husband, from your children, from your neighbors, from your friends. It doesn't mean to say that you don't love them. It doesn't mean to say that you don't spend time with them, you engage with them, and, and, but you don't need anything from them. Why? Because you know yourself as the inherently peaceful, unconditionally fulfilled, presence of awareness. That is what you bring to your relationship. You don't make emotional, psychological demands on your husband, your, your partner, your friend, your... Sometimes because these teachings have been so helpful to me um, and has helped me so much on my path, I try and share them with people and do you, how do you suggest doing that? Or is it better not to share with people that might not be open to it? Okay, uh, that, that, that's a, a, a good, uh, uh, that's an important question, Lisa. Um, yes, if uh, the, 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 the general rule, um, and this is just a generalization, of course, there are always exceptions, but the, the general rule is that if someone doesn't, if someone, as you say, is closed, they're not interested, they don't ask you anything, 
then don't impose it on them. I mean, w w would w would you ever um, uh, would you ever force your children to play tennis if they were not interested in playing tennis? So of course you wouldn't. You wouldn't dream of it just because you love playing. I, I no idea. It's just an example, but let's say you love playing tennis. You, you, you would you would make it available. But if 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 they like um, riding horses or studying physics or or whatever it is, then you you give them that freedom. So don't impose your understanding on people. It's best to say too little than to say too much. In fact, it's best not to say anything unless somebody asks you. Then if somebody asks you, then you've had an invitation and you can respond and you, and you should respond from your own experience and understanding. But don't worry, Lisa, if, if people don't ask you or they don't seem to share your interest in and love of these matters don't worry because there are so many ways in which peace and joy and love communicate themselves they, they do not need to be communicated through words peace I'm, I'm sure you i'm sure we all here well know the experience of being with someone who is at peace or happy in themselves that person may not be talking they may be they may be just one of a group of people that you just notice them and their peace communicates itself to you their joy communicates itself to you without their having said anything to you i'm sure you know that experience yes and that is the that is the safest way this uh, to 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 share this understanding because you can argue with words someone someone who was a scientist or a, a fundamentalist christian could easily uh, um, disagree with something that i've said this evening and could argue with me about it to prove that what i've said is not true etc cetera, etc cetera. but you can't argue with peace and happiness i mean peace and happiness is its own evidence so don't worry if if of course i understand because you love this understanding and it has obviously helped you so much and it is natural particularly if you see others suffering that you want to share your path to peace with, with them but you have to be skillful and sensitive and uh, not impose it on them uh, but but know that even if you don't say anything just just your peace will awaken at least to a degree that their essential nature of peace ju just by your your proximity to them thank you nice to to meet you lisa i wish you and your family the very best thank you so much Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Rupert. We have a question from Elaine Guardo. I will promote you. Elaine. Hey, hi, Rupert. Nice to see you again. Where are you? There you are. Hi, hi. So good to see you too, Rupert. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. I have to reiterate what Lisa said, your teachings um, transformative. Um, I think I always ask the same question in different forms. So this one is how to deal with uh, the collective suffering, the um, injustice, the social injustice that's happening during a pandemic and how, how to navigate that um is it is it just the same as just basically holding close any kind of lack is it the same well the the most important thing elaine is not to come from a place of lack in yourself because if we are coming from a place of lack then whatever our contribution may um, effect in our circumstance subtly our sense of 
sense of lack will be communicating itself and thus perpetuating the underlying problem that we are trying to resolve because all the problems almost all of humanity's problems stem ultimately from the fact that we have overlooked the nature of our own being and as a result we are not in touch with its innate peace and joy and we are therefore exploiting the world exploiting the earth exploiting others for the sole purpose of bringing happiness to ourselves so the first thing we must be absolutely sure of is that we are not doing the same thing uh, and then if we are uh, um, sure of that then we uh, go out into the world we face the world from uh, this uh, uh, this perspective uh, from this knowledge this feeling understanding of ourself as the presence of awareness and we meet whatever circumstance we find ourselves in with this understanding and that of course varies for each of us but each of us can bring this understanding into our own sphere our own circle of activities whatever that is for each of us some of us will have a relatively small uh, sphere in which we operate others are operating on a larger scale that that doesn't matter it's not the scale that that's important it, all that matters is that each of us in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in that we bring this understanding out into our communicate our communities and we share it and we respond to our current circumstances from this perspective and i know from many conversations that we've had i know that you're you're very moved by um, social injustice and, and inequality and, and, and these issues. And that's beautiful, Elaine, that, that you're so touched by that. And I know also that you have a, a deep uh, love of and interest in and understanding of these matters. So you, you are beautifully placed to, to go out into your community and respond to whatever it is you, you see in your community and to try to bring this understanding to not in the way that I'm doing it. Obviously, it's not appropriate to speak. This is, this is a very unusual group of people we, where I can speak very directly and, and um, uncompromisingly about these matters. So you will have to tailor this understanding to the circumstance. Each, each, everyone will have to tailor this understanding to the circumstances in which they find themselves. And that, that, is the, that is the skill or the art of tailoring this understanding moment to moment, not just bringing fixed ideas, fixed concepts, fixed practices, fixed beliefs. That, that, that's, that's when the, 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 the true tradition, which is a living flame, degenerates and becomes a religion, becomes dogma. Uh, so it's important that, that this understanding is is kept alive and is reformulated afresh again and again and again in response to whatever situation we find ourselves in. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I, and I, I'm just wondering how you draw, how you say yes to the pandemic. And is it, I mean, maybe you just answered that and I'm just not quite sure. You, you say, you say yes to it, Elaine, simply because it, <laughs> it is happening. It is, what, it is what we are faced with. If we were to trace back the causes of this pandemic, we would, we would in the end, the entire universe cooperates with the production of, of a single event. We were to trace back the, the causes of the pandemic and, and to connect each cause, you'd end up with the Big Bang. Well, if you're going to take on, if you're going to take on, the, 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 that's an awful lot to take on. 
Uh, and, that, and, and please don't misunderstand me, uh, Elaine. I don't mean to say that, that, that in the face of the pandemic, we just think, oh, well, it, it's happening. Let's not do anything about it. No, of course, we should do some, it's, something about it. Of, of, of course we should, but not from a place of resistance, right. from a place of, of complete openness. We say, yes, this, this is what is happening. What is the appropriate response moment by moment? whatever that is for each of us and however each of us can contribute. Some of us may be able to contribute politically, others may be able to just help in our local communities. Uh, there, are, there are so many ways that each of us can, can help. Thank you. Thank you. But the greatest help, the greatest help that we can give, and, and I don't mean that this um, that we shouldn't be responding to the pandemic. I, th I think we, we we most certainly should be. So please don't misunderstand it. But the greatest help we can give anyone is to uh, indicate to them that the peace and the joy for which they long resides in their own being because the vast majority of people are seeking peace and happiness in objective experience, objects, substances, activities, states of mind, circumstances, relationships, etc. And it's not there. If, if, if we had, nobody would be here at this gathering today if they had found the peace and happiness for which they long in objective experience. In fact, we are all here precisely because our search for peace and happiness in objective experience hasn't worked. So that, 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 is, the, that is the ultimate gift. And I, I know that, I, I know that you know this, Elaine. Um, and as I say, Please don't think that I'm implying that one should not at the same time respond appropriately to the pandemic. I, I think each of us should. Of course. In our own way. Of course. It's lovely. To, are you singing, Elaine? Yes. Virtually. Yeah. Uh, the virtual, you're a virtual yes. choir? Yes, we are lovely. a virtual choir. Lovely. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Take care. Nice to see you again. Great to see you, Rupert. Stay well. Hi, thanks. Thank you. Uh, now we'll take a question from Gioa. Iris, hi. I hi Rupert. Can you I can I can hear I can hear you, but I can't see you. There you are. Hi, Aris. Nice to see you. Lovely to see you. Okay, um, my question is dealing with the, this, this kind of play that hide and seek awareness seems to play with itself. Um, now with the manifesting and dissolving, which is clear to me, but I'm, I'm quite interested to the concealing action that awareness play, seems to play because uh, I noticed that uh, every happening, every daily happening could be a portal to the recognition, let's say, and especially the tiny resistance or the slightly discomfort, even if they are very, very subtle, uh, they are so precious. And in that moment, awareness seems to concealing yes. itself. Yeah. Yes, it, 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 it's true that the, the slightest resistance, when we face experience with the slightest resistance, we are not facing it as the presence of awareness. We are facing it as a, a bundle of thoughts and feelings that are saying, 
I don't like what is present. I want what is not present. So that, that thought or that feeling does not arise on behalf of awareness. It arises on behalf of the conditioned self. So the soon as that thought arises, awareness goes back into hiding in the background. Okay. So you're right that that thought conceals or seems to conceal the presence of awareness and its innate peace. Okay, so it's still awareness that uh, gives you, I mean, that play this resistance to call you back. Yes, uh, ultimately it, it is awareness itself that assumes the form of the resisting thought and feeling, just as it is the screen that assumes the form of the image. And that is why uh, you know in, in in Malayani's beautiful book, The Unity of Being, it says, he veils himself with himself. In other words, the, the, the resisting thought and feeling is itself the activity of awareness with which awareness seems to veil itself from itself. And, and as a result, it, suffering is experienced and suffering is, is the core, is awareness calling itself back to itself. Yes. Okay. Suffering is, is the is the is the alarm bell. Yes. Uh, awareness has l lost itself in experience, and it, it is calling itself, "Come back to me." What you are looking for lies behind you. Yes. And let's say that you comes to a point where everything is awareness. No, and well, could be that you feel you are ready to, because it's happening to me to be, you know, I was biking in the park and it was a love making moment with everything, especially the nature after lockdown and so on. And uh, suddenly I feel that I was totally okay with dissolving and just absorbing back to awareness. And I was totally okay with, you know, dissolving this experience of... Yes. But yes. I, I, I'm not sure if there is a, a subtle resistance or a resistance to something else, or it was... I don't know. I just... It was the first time that I felt that I was ready to disappear, actually, in this form. Yeah, exactly. There's a complete surrendering to your current experience no desire to uh, no impulse to resist anything no impulse to hold on to anything so you find yourself totally in the moment because why would you escape the moment there's nothing in the moment that you're resisting there'll be no attempt to replace the current experience with a new experience so it's a complete uh, a moment by moment welcoming, a moment by moment letting go. So even, even your own um, identity as a person, which, which is attachments to thoughts, feelings, activities, relationships, you, you let them all go. It's a kind of death. It, it's, it's what it, it's meant to, to die before you die. It, it is a letting go of everything not just the objects in our life and the relationships, the act, but, but also our, our own thoughts and feelings. It just, it's a total letting go of, of everything that we thought we were. It, it is a sort of death, yes. Or at least a readiness. A, a, a readiness to, to dissolve, as you say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sweet to see you, Aris. How are things in Italy? Are you, is it um, have things opened up a bit there? You're allowed. You can go out and about a bit now. And yes, they open up. I'll just a little. We have an, an hour, hour and a half each day to 
breathe outside, let's say. Good. 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 And your family are well? Everyone is very well, very safe. Good. Good. Hope the same for you and your family. Yes, all, all well. Thank you. Sweet to see you. Take care. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It looks like we have one uh, time for one last question. Leonardo, I will promote you. Hi, Leonardo. Hello. Uh, I can, for some reason, I lost the uh, image. Uh, from Zoom, but I so I don't know if you are being able to see me. Uh, I can't see you. It's, it's, it's usually down in the in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. Oh yeah, yes. It's just that I can I just see my screen. I I can't see even the Zoom uh, platform, but I don't think that's important. Uh, uh, so first, thank you very much for bringing your teachings here, uh, uh, as well as Garrison Institute to provide for providing this and all those who are participating for making this possible. Um, my question was uh, based on what you were just talking, uh, I would say 20 minutes ago or so. So it may be a little bit out of context right now, but I would like to know if you would like to elaborate, if you want to, on, the, on your definitions of awareness, consciousness, and self. And uh, I would be more than glad to to listen to you about this. Okay. Well, first of all, Leonardo, I use the words awareness, consciousness, and self synonymously. And I would define awareness as that with which all experience is known, that in which all experience appears and that out of which all experience is made. And another way of defining it would be awareness is the reality from which or the, the, the infinite, indivisible reality from which everyone and everything derive their apparently independent existence. So those would be two, two definitions, of course, one, one could define awareness in many other ways. None of them are completely accurate. It's not possible to define awareness, but those would be two possible definitions of awareness or consciousness or ourself. Well, that's very, very fascinating. Then. So Sorry, when... I, I didn't, you cut out then, Leonardo, what, what did you say? I didn't hear you. No, I'm saying that it's fascinating, very interesting. And thank you very much for your answer. Thank you, Leonardo. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. You too. All right. Well, that's... Does that bring us to an end, Amy? Super. Yes, that's perfect timing. Okay. Um, well, th thank you. Um, thank you to everyone at, at um, Garrison, um, Amy, um, Monique, Michael, Valerie, um, Thank you all for inviting me and putting this on. Sweet to be with you all. Um, I miss coming to Garrison. I hope it won't be long before we're able to resume live meetings, but it's beautiful that we can meet like this in the meantime. Um, for many of you, I think, know already, I do webinars uh, twice a week online like this. I have a a weekend meditation coming up at the end of May and a week-long retreat online at the end of June. So all the details are on the website, um, my website, if you're um, 
if if you're interested. And uh, thank you, thank you all for coming to visit me here in my in my sitting room in Oxford. It's been lovely to to spend this evening with you. Thank you. Thank you again, Rupert. Nice to see that uh, all of your attendees are, are good friends and that you know them by name. Uh, thank you everyone who's joined us today. And as Rupert mentioned, for more information about his work, you can visit him at uh, www.rupertspira.com. Our next session is Tuesday, May 26th with Rick Hansen. Please keep checking garrisoninstitute.org for updated listings of future sessions and to view the recording of this session and others. Again, we provide these for free. Uh, if you would like to support this effort, please consider making a donation at garrisoninstitute.org. May everyone be happy, healthy, and safe. Thank you. <laughs>